This is PowerPoint lecture on Chapter 16, Cardiovascular Medications. Major roles of the cardiovascular system is to deliver nutrients such as oxygen, hormones, and immune and clotting factors to the body and to carry waste products like CO2 out of the cells. Again, the heart has four chambers, left and right atrium and left and right ventricle, which contract and relax in a coordinated rhythm. When we think about the pulmonary circulation, um, I think about it simply as that the blood goes from the body to the right side of the heart, to the lungs, to the left side of the heart, and back to the body again. Many cardiovascular medications exist today to help patients with all kinds of illnesses. Cardiovascular medications, they make the environment less hostile for the heart to function. They can increase or decrease the heart rate. They can make the heart function more efficiently or make it less irritable. Lastly, these medications can make the heart tissue less sensitive. When blood flow is impaired, tremendous damage can happen to our bodies. Many times this is caused by a blood clot. A thrombus is a clot in a vessel, and an embolism is a clot that breaks loose and travels. A clot can form in the heart and cause a myocardial infarction or heart attack. A clot can travel to the brain and cause a CVA or cerebral vascular accident or stroke, simply put. A thrombus can form in a vein and cause a DVT or a deep vein thrombosis. Clots can cause damage wherever they lodge. A myocardial infarction is another name for a heart attack. And with that, you have angina pectoris, which is chest pain. That's caused by lack of oxygen to the heart. Um, so symptoms of a heart attack are angina, sweating, skin, and cyanosis, which is bluing of the skin. Anti-anginal medications dilate the arteries and veins so we get more blood and oxygen to the heart. Nitroglycerin is our primary anti-anginal medication. It can be given sublingual, buccal, IV, or transdermal. Sublingual is the most common route, and that's what we use to give um, in the little bottle we give to the patients to take home with them. The directions for that sublingual nitroglycerin is to take one every five minutes for angina with a maximum of three tablets. If you're still having pain after three tablets, which would be 15 minutes, you need to call EMS, you know, call 911. Anticoagulants prevent clot formation by interrupting production of cofactors that help in the clotting process. Um, there's a big long clotting cascade if any of you have taken the patho, um, patho class and you learned about that. Um, medications that do this are warfarin or coumadin, heparin, enaxoparin, which is lovenox. Heparin and um, lovenox are given sub-Q in patients who are at risk for patients who are at risk for developing DVTs. Coumadin is an orally. Patients that are at risk for um, DVTs are patients who are on bed rest, if they've had fractures of the pelvis, um, patients that are obese, have had recent surgery, and a family history of blood clots. When a patient has a DVT, as shown here in this picture, they'll have pain, swelling, and redness in the leg. Heparin may also be given for DVTs and can dissolve blood clots, so, and it's usually given IV. Antiplatelet medication works a little differently, and it prevents the platelets from clumping together or clotting. Over-the-counter aspirin is a great antiplatelet medication besides being an NSAID, and it's shown promise in increasing survival rates of um, heart attack victims if taken with initial symptoms and it's also showing promise in preventing subsequent heart attacks if taken daily. And usually that's a baby or 81 milligrams. The adenosine triphosphate or ADP 
receptor blockers. Those are another kind of antiplatelet medication, and these can be used for long term for prevention of blood clots. Clobidogrel or Plavix is um, our most popular one of these. When we have patients on antiplatelets, it's really important that they learn about signs of bleeding and precautions, which include limiting vitamin K. Vitamin K plays a key role in helping the body, body clot, preventing excess bleeding. So does it make sense that patients should avoid foods high in vitamin K when they're taking blood thinners, aka anticoagulants and antiplatelet medications? Foods that are high in vitamin K are mainly your green leafy vegetables. Thrombolytic agents dissolve clots. TPA or tissue plasminogen activators are one example of these. These medications need to be given within 60 minutes of the onset of a stroke and they can minimize those horrific um, symptoms that can happen with a stroke. When patients are on these medicines, it disrupts clotting, so many times we have to do blood tests to monitor how their clotting is going. We certainly don't want the blood too thin. Um, a PTT, which is a partial prothast time, or a PT, which is a prothrombin time, or an INR, which is an international nationalized ratio, those are our common blood tests that evaluate clotting. So it's a PT, PTT, and INR. On the opposite side of the coin, we do have antifibrinolytics, and they help clots to form when patients are hemorrhaging. Again, we do have antidotes for anticoagulants. Vitamin K is an antidote for Coumadin, vitamin K, Coumadin, and protamine sulfate, PMS, is the antidote for heparin. Hematopoietic stimulant medications stimulate growth of blood cells. These medications are used to treat anemia, low blood iron levels, and patients on chemotherapy. Chemotherapy patients have lowered blood levels um, due to bone marrow suppression. Hematopoietic medications include ferrous sulfate, which is iron, cyancobalamin, which is vitamin B12, and Philgastrin, which is Nupigen. Let's um, review briefly shock. Um, with shock, the cardiovascular system collapses. This affects every portion of the body. The metabolism slows, urine output decreases, blood pressure lowers, heart rate increases, Respirations get rapid and shallow, and the patient can have anxiety, confusion. Um, they can get lethargic, you know, which is kind of sleepy and restless. To treat shock, we target the underlying cause. Vasopressors are most commonly used to increase blood pressure, which are epinephrine and norepinephrine. Remember these from the adrenergic medications? Lastly, let's talk about cholesterol. You know, our bodies naturally make cholesterol, and, and it's really critical. The cholesterol is critical for normal cell function. But too much cholesterol in the blood can cause a buildup of plaque on the walls of the arteries. This buildup can eventually cause the arteries to narrow or harden. Sudden blood clots in these narrowed arteries can cause, again, heart attack or stroke. But not all lipids or fats are the same. The high-density lipids, HDL, those are healthy HDL. They clean out the blood vessels. Low-density lipids, LDL, that's our lousy lipids. They deposit fat in the vessels. And then we have very lousy, <laughs> or the very low-density lipids. And those wedge themselves in blood vessel walls. Lifestyle change is always the first and best option for those that have high cholesterol. But when that's not enough, HMG, COA, reductase inhibitors are our first line of defense. These drugs encourage the liver to make less cholesterol and increase the number of LDL receptors in the liver. By doing this, the LDL receptors grab the circulating LDL or that lousy cholesterol from the blood. 
These drugs are also known as statins because they all end in statin. Lovastatin, which is Mevacor, Semivastatin, or Zocor, and the list goes on. Fatty statin. Side effects are hepatotoxicity, so the blood will need to be drawn to make sure that the liver is handling these medications okay. M is for myalgia, which is muscle pain, and this is really common with these meds. Also, um, rash can happen. And lastly, G or is girls who are pregnant should not take this medication. These meds are category X.